What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with more X-Men content because you guys have been screaming for this. We're doing X-Men Red. Now, here's one thing I want to specify. For those who are current on X-Men Red, we're only covering one through four here. And the reason why is because five and six are tie-ins for the Judgment Day event. So the only way to make those make sense is to actually do those as tie-ins for our coverage of Judgment Day. So that's why we're calling this volume one, even though it's only one through four. Having said that, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with X-Men Red, this story is amazing. What this does here is this initially opens up by answering the question how it is that Storm became the queen regent of Mars, i.e. Arako. Because remember, where you initially had the end of the Inferno event, Ten of Swords, all that kind of stuff, and you had uh, Arako and Krakoa that were supposed to merge into a singular landmass back to the way they used to be, that was rejected. And so instead, Arako ended up being taken to Mars, and it basically operates there, right? So it's kind of a, a place where the citizens of Arako can live their own life, because the, the citizens of Arako and the citizens of Krakoa, they have distinctly different views on things. And in fact, that's going to be a main focus of this story. But the way that Storm got her position was actually by challenging Nameless, the shapeshifter queen, who can basically take on the form of whoever it is she's facing or virtually anybody and duplicate their powers as well. So she's not really similar to Mystique as much as she is copycat Vanessa Carlisle, who can not only shapeshift into people, but also take their powers or copy their powers as well. And so she actually shapeshifted into Storm when she was at her peak, which is a nice little touch by Tom Taylor here. But as the two of them are basically fighting, of course, Storm ultimately comes out on top indirectly in the sense that she actually freezes uh, Nameless in her place. And instead of accepting defeat, Nameless simply kills herself. Now, one of the things that I want to specify here is that the, the challenge and, and really the fight for, from Nameless isn't based strictly on her position in what is in effect the Arako version of the Quiet Council on Krakoa, right? Arako's own governing body, essentially, it's this idea that Storm is seen as an outsider. The reality here is Arakos, the, the Arakan people see, or I guess the Araki as they're pronounced, they see Krakoans as outsiders. And so Storm showing up here and challenging an Araki for her position is such that it's seen as an, as an outsider challenging a rightful ruler. But ultimately, the, the role is maintained, right? The challenge is upheld, Storm wins, and she ends up gaining a seat on the Great Ring of Arako, which again, is Arako's version version of the Quiet Council on Krakoa. And so as a result of this, you do have an, have an interesting list here. Among these, and really the mo uh, most intriguing, is Iska the Unbeaten. Now, of course, you also do have Tarn, and we'll end up talking about him shortly, right? We'll talk about him here in a little bit. But Iska the Unbeaten, who's going to be a particularly important part of the story here in a little while, those of you guys who are unfamiliar with her, she's the one that can never lose, right? So whatever, it's, it's one of those things where she's like, let's say, for example, that you have a battle to the death, right? Say, for example, that Magneto's fighting Xavier, right? Iska could look at that and say, I think Magneto's going to win. Magneto's victory is guaranteed. No matter what side she chooses, it's just kind of one of those giant Mary suits. But we're going to find one of these really interesting elements where her power can actually be used against her. But you do get a few things where stuff's kind of settling in. For example, Magneto, after resigning from the Quiet Council, took up residence on Araco. Now, one of the reasons why, and really the big reason why Magneto resigned from the Council was the aftermath of Inferno. Maura McTaggart, all that kind of stuff. The reality of what had been done basically being leaked out to the rest of, of Krakoa, and the fact that the hidden agenda of Maura McTaggart was that she believed that the only way to save the mutant population was to get rid of it. So to basically manipulate the entire resurrection process so that as mutants were resurrected, they would ultimately be resurrected without their powers. And it would be assumed that something went wrong or whatever it was, but it would be beyond contestation. And because of the fact that these mutants would be resurrected as essentially humans, they would be banished from Krakoa. And so ultimately, Maura McTaggart could weed the mutant population down to nothing. Xavier and Magneto saw this as a massive betrayal. And in the aftermath of everything, Magneto quit. He was just disillusioned with Krakoa in a lot of ways. So what he ends up doing, of course, showing up here in Araco, ends up coming across what is basically a fisherman. This guy's gonna be referred to as Kingfisher later on down the line. But it's a cool little thing here because this guy is one where he sort of teaches Magneto the nature of what it means to truly be an Araco citizen in the sense that where Magneto asks him, like, is this land yours? His response is, it's everybody's land, right? This is not not like Krakoa and you guys on Earth, where you slice up sections of land and say, now this belongs to me. Nobody else can have this. He's like, this is for everybody here, right? Land existed before we were here, before you were here. It'll exist after you're dead. It does not belong.
belong to any one particular person because you've arbitrarily claimed dominion over it. That's not how we do things here. And so of course, it's really kind of a way for Magneto to kind of get back to his roots, to understand what it means to truly be part of something bigger. And in fact, Magneto is also going to experience a paradigm shift here. Now, following that, we switch over to what's basically called like the red bar, essentially, right? The red lagoon, as it's called. So again, much of what you see here on Arako is kind of an extension of Krakoa, just with different names, right? Krakoa has the green lagoon, Arako has the red lagoon because Mars is a red planet. And so, of course, this whole place is basically led by Robert DaCosta, Sunspot, which is a cool little touch here. But you do have Gabriel Summers, Vulcan. Now, Vulcan's going to be a huge part of this story. But at the moment, something that you'll probably notice between Hickman's run and this run is that Vulcan is a lot more angry, right? He's much angrier than he used to be and a lot more mentally unstable. Now, this is kind of explained from a couple different places. The first one is from Jerry Dugan's X-Men run with issue number 10, which we haven't necessarily covered yet, but it's also explained here. So we're going to kind of jump forward in the story for a second. But the reality is that for those of you guys who recall the War of Kings story and really just the nature of Vulcan himself, that when the events of the rise and fall of the Shi'ar Empire took place, which was basically where Vulcan had learned the reality of his parents' death, or at least his uh, mother's death, at the hands of like the Shi'ar, that he was born on the Shi'ar, uh, Shi'ar homeworld, all that kind of stuff, learning his true history, he traveled to the Shi'ar empire and then ultimately conquered it and became its emperor. This eventually led to an event called the War of Kings, and it kind of happened by just different circumstances. It wasn't a direct continuation, but you ended up getting the War of Kings where it was like Black Bolt versus Vulcan, and then that led to a great big huge conflict which ripped a fissure in space. That's what led to Thanos' imperative and the Cancerverse, that during that story, Vulcan was basically pulled into the Cancer and was dissected by these different aliens and what they had done based on these plans that have really haven't come to fruition yet again this is kind of a big retcon that what they'd done with uh, with Vulcan is they had suppressed his true personality and then essentially replaced it with a more toned down and relaxed personality and so that is the way that Tom Taylor is explaining how it is that we went from like the crazy ultra violent Vulcan back in the day to like suddenly this more toned down relaxed and chill Vulcan that we suddenly saw during Hickman's run now, whether that was the initial plan with this character and it's just now coming to fruition or Tom Taylor's doing his own thing, I don't really know here, but that's the way that was done. The kicker here is that during times of like emotional distress and so on, the true personality of Vulcan starts to come out and that's what's going on here. Because it was believed that Vulcan had died, even though he had never actually died, that when he was kind of out of the picture, this led to Gladiator taking control of the Shi'ar Empire, really just on a kind of replacing Vulcan as its ruler and and then passing that down to Zandra, who is basically a girl that has the genetic material of both Xavier and Lalandra. So he wasn't, she wasn't really born by way of the two of them just like touching naughty bits, but just their genetic material when they were both basically dead, that this kind of pisses him off. He sees himself as the rightful heir to the throne of the Shi'ar, but he's not ruling the Shi'ar and he's not seen as an emperor of the Shi'ar. Now, a lot of this goes into the always existing desire of Vulcan to be adored. And in fact, this is gonna be preyed on later because this kind of, uh, argument here leads to a skirmish which actually sees Abigail Brand and Cable stepping in and basically bringing it into it. Now one of the things to know here is that the most recent video that we did that had Cable had his younger self now we have his older self. The explanation for this here is that there came a point when Strife returned. Strife basically being the clone of Cable from the future this basically a bad guy. The younger version of Cable realized the only way to beat Strife was to bring his older version back and when that was done because of the rules of Krakow saying that there can't be two of the same kind of person walking around, the younger Cable went back to his own future and the older Cable stayed behind. From a publishing side, it was Marvel just getting rid of the younger Cable, which nobody was really receptive to. He was kind of a cool character, but a lot of people just want to see the old Cable. Now, this is probably also due to the fact that, like, the Marvel Cinematic Universe now has Deadpool, Josh Brolin's Cable is probably going to come back in some way, so they're just doing things to kind of bring stuff further in line with the MCU. Uh, but beyond that, it's basically just Marvel kind of setting things back to normal. So that's how you get older Cable here instead of younger Cable. Younger Cable wasn't aged up or anything like that. But the thing behind this is Abigail Brand recognizes the desire of Gabriel Summers to be adored by the people around him. And she initially starts to use it as a kind of weapon, right? Sort of manipulating him to a degree. Now, the other part of this, and we'll, we'll kind of get to that manipulation here in a second. The other part of this is the nature of Storm herself. One of the things to know, and it's what's so interesting about Tom Taylor's writing here, is the value of Storm and the, the idea behind Storm is largely relegated to you 
understanding the history of Storm. Storm's whole history in a lot of ways has been facing off against various people to establish herself in some kind of a leadership role. But what she never wanted was to be seen as some kind of a dictator or definitive ruler whose authority is beyond contestation. She never wanted to be seen that way. And so that's why even during this, this instance where she's talking to like the Iska, the Unbeaten, and they're talking about how like she's a queen, she's in this like position of authority, no one can question her, so on and so forth, that the response of Storm is no. But if I'm going to live among the Arako people, I cannot show up here as a Krakoan and say, I wrestled control from your previous leader, now I am the leader, everybody has to do what I say. No, that the entire basis behind the people of Arako is they fight together, they die together, and they live together. There is a far greater sense of community among the people of Arako than there is virtually anybody on Earth, and Storm recognizes that. So even when people behind the scenes try to manipulate her or challenge her or what have you and saying like, you're an absolute queen here, you have an absolute authority, Storm rejects it, even going so far as to destroy the throne on Arako and saying, there are no thrones here. There are no definitive leaders. There are those of us with some measure of authority, but at the end of the day, we work with those around us as opposed to as opposed to over those who are around us. And that's what's kind of crazy here is because what you end up getting is literally Robert DaCosta who shows up to Magneto in this new palace he's created for himself, right, called the Autumn Palace, which is just an amazing name for a citadel. Also being joined alongside Fisher King, who actually is from Morocco, but doesn't have any powers. So about as close as you can get to like a traditional human being. But one of the things that he had established is that because of the fact that he had fought and bled among the Arako people, he basically earned their respect. So sure, he does not have powers, but he is of Arako and they respect his accomplishments because for the people of Arako, it's less about what powers you have and more about what you've accomplished in terms of like earning honorable recognition among like fighting among them and being like a genuine person and so on and so forth. And so where Robert DaCosta again shows up here and says, look, Abigail Brand is up to something and she is inevitably going to form her own team. She's going to form what is essentially going to be her version of the X-Men. We have to have something to counter that. The response of, of Magneto is, I mean, we can, but like, I don't want to be some kind of an X-Man. And the reality here is that if we are going to do this, I don't want to be someone who stands apart from the Araco people, right? I want to be a part of the Araco people themselves to fall in line with their beliefs and their customs because it's more in line with what I believe on a personal level. This leads to Storm showing up and saying, I believe the exact same thing. If we are going to form a team here, then it needs to be a team that is of the Arako people. And when the question by Magneto is asked, then what's the balance, right? Who defends the broken land? The response of Storm is the Brotherhood does. So in effect, you basically have Abigail Brand forming her own X-Men team. Storm and Magneto and them are forming their own team called the Brotherhood. But the other thing behind this, and this is something else to keep in mind, is that there comes a point when we end up finding out that Gabriel Summers at Vulcan is far more unstable than we initially thought. So much so that he actually created energy constructs in the form of Petra and Sway. Now, Petra and Sway were two members of the original, or I guess the second version of the X-Men that were created in secret that were introduced during the original X-Men Deadly Genesis story arc. So you're welcome to check out that story if you want to, to get a better understanding of it. But the truth is that they're not actually there. They're not actually alive. And when Gabriel Summers is confronted by this information by Xavier, who's actually been trying to work with Gabriel in order to show him he's becoming mentally unstable, but being an Omega level mutant with the ability to control virtually any form of energy that this presents as a very dangerous situation that Xavier says, hey, like, so we've made some, some modifications and some enhancements with Cerebro. We can bring back all kinds of people now, right? We can bring back like Thunderbird or Changeling or Petra and Sway who were not actually here, even though you see them, that Gabriel rejects it. And in doing so, actually just attacks everybody and kills Xavier and Cyclops in the process. Now, where they are resurrected, the reality is that because of his mental instability, he's banned from the Summer's house. He's not allowed to return. And so this is why Abigail Brand is using the mental instability of Gabriel to her advantage. Even going so far as saying, like, I get that what you want is the is recognition, and recognition is what you deserve. So what I suggest you do is you challenge Tarn the Uncaring for his seat on the Great Circle, right? For his seat on the throne, or at least on as part of the Inner Council for Araco. You challenge him. Not only that, I also want you to join my newly assembled X-Men team, which is like Cable, whose name speaks for himself, right? Like Man 
Manifold who can teleport, Frenzy, which is cool to see that they're still doing something with her. I've been a fan of her ever since her introduction. I think it was her introduction. In the old X Factor comics, right? X Factor issue number five uh, with Apocalypse. It's cool to see that kind of stuff, right? Like it's cool to see that they kind of maintain these characters, but it's really her bringing Gabriel onto the team, launching their own X-Men. And what ends up happening in their first outing is they actually respond to what is in effect some kind of just crazy scientists with these giant robots, each of which have powers that are basically looking to attain information from Araco, right? Like literally looking to like conquer Araco or not really conquer it, but like steal from the people and attack them and so on and so forth. Just your normal villain kind of stuff. The big difference here is that when Abigail Brand's team shows up here on the scene, that Gabriel Summers kind of becomes an extension of his own arrogance in the sense that Cable is annihilated almost immediately. And that where Abigail Brand's like, look, we have to get these people away. We have to protect them, so on and so forth. The response of, of really like a, a frenzy and even a few other people here are like, no, they don't want to be like rescued. They don't want to be saved. What they want is they want to fight to save their own land. This is a proud people. They're used to fighting for what, for, for what belongs to them. We have to work alongside them in this way. But even Gabriel Summers rejects it. And it's just kind of like, these are like powerless people who are small, right? They have, there's nothing there. So he literally tells them, go away, right? Like everybody, you just need to leave, so on and so forth, and tries to impose his own will onto them, which of course they reject. This leads to him actually empowering up to attack them, only for him to be frozen in place by Storm and the Brotherhood who arrive on the scene. And then contrary to what Abigail Brand's team was doing, that you actually have Fisher King, again, who's recognized as some measure of a champion among the Araco people, who approaches them and says, hey, look, I'm a part of this team called the Brotherhood, we're not here to force you to like disperse. We're here because we recognize what you all are capable of. You have fought and you have bled for the land that you value fought and bleed alongside us as we help you cast off these forces. That's what the Araco people are receptive to. And so where Magneto could not initially get a foothold in using his power on these giant robots due to their ability to protect themselves from the electromagnetic abilities of Magneto himself, that in all these forces gathering together, while they're not the most powerful and they could never defeat these things on their own, what it does do is it grants a distraction. And in that distraction, Magneto is able to find a weakness and in doing so, destroys these guys. And so when that takes place, you of course have Gabriel Summers who just lashes out angry at the fact that he never died. And in fact, he goes to attack Storm only for Storm to overpower him. Now, this is something that you don't normally see all that often. And in fact, it's a phenomenal concept because she's just like, look, right? You manipulate energy and so do I. You are an Omega level mutant and so am I. This is not a clash of mutant weapons. This is a battle of will. Feel the power circle us, building from one to the other, seeking a weakness, a break in our armor a flaw. You speak of a fire that burns inside you, a flame dancing in the wind. Inside me, child, is the hurricane. And she just like, Wow! Just like overpowers this guy and knocks him out. And it's crazy to see Storm overpower Vulcan that way. It just shows how capable she is. It's kind of astounding. And so in the aftermath of this, and the fact that Vulcan has suffered such a humiliating defeat, that Abigail Brand again feeds on this and saying, now is your time to challenge Tarn the Uncaring. Now's your time to overpower this guy and take his position on the throne. And so that's exactly what happens, right? That what you end up getting is a couple different things. One, Magneto is approached by uh, Robert Costa in saying, you should also vie for a position on the throne as well. You should challenge Tarn the Uncaring to take his place, as opposed to allowing Abigail Brand to put one of her people on the throne, right? It's literally a game of thrones. It's a game of politics is basically what this is. Magneto initially shoots it down and is like, no, I don't want to be in that position, that, that role again. I don't want to do that. And so what we end up doing is switching over to Gabriel Summers facing off against Tarn. Now, this is a cool thing because this is where Iska the Unbeaten comes in, that you have Robert DaCosta who sits down next to her, and the two of them just kind of have this discussion. And the question is asked, like, who do you think can actually win here against these two guys? And Iska doesn't really provide much of an answer, right? Just because of the fact that she wants to abstain. She doesn't want to really sway things either way. But it is particularly intriguing here because what you have are two wildly powerful beings. So Vulcan has the ability to manipulate any form of energy. It doesn't matter what it is. He just has to be taught about that energy. That's it. What you also have is Tarn, who can actually control the DNA structure of anybody around him. He can shut off powers. He can give powers. He can like heal people. He can do all kinds of stuff. If it's a DNA structure, he can manipulate it, which makes him ridiculously powerful because what actually goes on here is that him realizing that Gabriel Summers can manipulate any form of energy, Tarn shuts his power off 
just like that. And that's why I say like, like mutants like this, like Tarn the Uncaring, Leech, people like that, they are ridiculously powerful because of what use is someone who can alter reality if their power is taken away. With the powers of Gabriel Summers being shut off by Tarn the Uncaring, then it comes down to just a straight up one-on-one -on -one battle. And like literally, Tarn the Uncaring is a far more formidable opponent in just physical combat than Gabriel Summers is. And he beats him to death. He literally snaps his arm and then just kills him. And so at that point, he's like, I remain unbeaten. Is there anyone else out there, right? Is there no one else that can offer a credible challenge here? And that's when a voice comes out of nowhere and says, I will challenge you. And it turns out to be Magneto. Now, this is where things get interesting because where Tarn's powers had shut off the powers of Gabriel at the same time that Gabriel had shut off the powers of Tarn, that what you have here is his powers coming back now that Gabriel's dead and he doesn't have the ability that like his powers have no effect anymore. And so that's when Iska says, this is poor timing, right? Tarn's powers are returning. He'll stall another moment, then slaughter the old fool. And the response of, uh, of Robert DaCosta is sadly, I have to agree, Iska, I bet you Tarn wins. And because there was a bit of momentary banter between the two, where they were just kind of going back and forth and kind of, you know, basically just being in opposition to each other as a kind of instinctual gut reaction, like Iska the Unbeaten just kind of thinks, no, I bet Magneto wins. And that solidifies the victory of Magneto. Literally, her power was manipulated. And that's the kicker to Iska the Unbeaten, that on the surface and the way she was originally introduced during Hickman's run, she was a Mary Sue, right? It was just kind of like, well, you know, uh, I never lose, so whatever side I choose wins. And that's basically it. Even her own decisions are not necessarily her own. But with Robert DaCosta manipulating her due to like the friendly banter between the two, that momentary thought of, nope, I bet Magneto wins, that solidifies the victory of Magneto. And that's exactly what happens, right? That quite literally, like Magneto realizes the nature of Tarn's powers and he literally takes his helmet off and attaches it to Tarn's head. And he says, okay, so like where Tarn's like trying to figure out what's going on, the response of Magneto is, is we're allowed non-mutant weapons as I understand it. Your control of DNA is psychokinetic in nature, meaning you use your mind to do it. My, my helmet blocks mental powers and it's made of metal. So he's like, goodbye Tarn and just crushes the helmet around the head of Tarn and kills him on the spot and Magneto wins. It's it's so cool because this, this is one of the best moments ever because what it solidifies is Magneto being as capable as he is, is not just limited to his powers. It's limited to how he thinks. It's limited to how he is. It's, it's based on how he sees things that because Magneto has been around for so long and he's fought so many different people of such varying levels of power that to fight him is to fight on a three-dimensional level considering all possibilities from all possible directions. That's one of the things that makes him such a capable guy. You take his just intelligence on the battlefield, you combine it with his powers, and you have the quintessential definition of an omega level being, right? Just an unstoppable being. And so that's when things get cool because what this does, kind of a, a quick little moment here, right? What this does is there are two things that come out of it. In that what Magneto does is he presents a resurrection orb to the governing body of Araco. And when they initially ask, is this your gift to us, right? The ability for us to resurrect, the response of Magneto is no. You value your lives based on what you do here, not some kind of endless, you know, going on forever resurrection process. He's like, but I value, you know, I value my life or I had previously valued my life based on my ability to return because Magneto had died and come back several times. And he says, but if I'm going to be of the people of Araco, then I will live as the people of Araco do. I will be one of you. I, I will not stand outside of you. And so in destroying this orb, what it actually contains are the backups of storm and Magneto. In effect, if they die, they're gone, right? Like, as we know them, they can be resurrected on Krakoa, but nothing they, they recall here will ever be brought back with them. They'll literally start back at square one. And so what it means is that their life here matters more than it ever did before. Now, with the questions asked by the council, okay, cool, but you are also here as a representative of Storm. Where is Storm and why isn't she here? The response of Magneto is because there's something else bigger going on here. And so what we end up doing is we switch to Storm in a conversation that she's having really with like Oracle and a few other people by way of Black Panther in the sense that like there is a massive calamity that has happened. That what's taken place here, and this will become a major plot thread going into like the future of the X-Men Red storyline, that what had happened here is Zandra, the leader of the Shi'ar Empire, has died. And that with the Empress of the Shi'ar Empire being killed, what it now means is the Empire is destabilized. That there will basically be a situation whereby the fringe worlds, the Galactic Rim, will actually start 
vying for this power vacuum, that it could lead to a civil war among the Shi'ar Empire, among those who are looking to take control. And so the big question that's being asked here is, what do we do? Because the big concern here is that this could turn into an astro-nuclear war, a repeat of the Operation Galactic Storm conflict, which technically was caused by the Kree, but it saw the detonation of this bomb that killed trillions of beings. And that could very well be a repeat here, right? A civil war on a galactic scale, countless individuals could die. And so in the presence of like Richard Ryder, Nova, and like all these different guys, the question is asked like, what do we do? And the initial response, and even Black Panther kind of chimes in and says, I mean, the Krakoans have the power of resurrection. Why not just resurrect her? Well, then at that point, the Galactic Rim raises this really interesting question. And they say, no, we reject that. Because why should the Empress receive the right of resurrection when nobody else can, right? When the average citizen can't, or her subjects can't, or the people who fight alongside her cannot receive that. Why does she receive some kind of special treatment? Not only that, if we do invoke the Kirkoan concept of resurrection, then what we effectively do is we put an immortal dictator on the seat of the throne. The reality of the nature of any empire is that people have their time. By whatever manner and whatever means, they serve as an emperor for whatever time period, and when they die, they die, and a new one takes over. The correct course of action here is to appoint a new empress. And the reality here is that Storm says that's not going to happen. Because here's the issue. Were you Oracle, right, the telepath and advisor of the uh, of the Shi'ar race, where you picked up on this just kind of huge amount of mind data that was released by Zandra as an Omega level mutant herself, right? As you, when you picked up on all this information, the question you have to ask yourself is, was it really meant for you, right? Outside of being some kind of an advisor to the Shi'ar race, it was never meant for you, right? It was never your purpose to have all this information. It's cool that you made us aware of this, but the target of that information was Charles Xavier of the X-Men. And Xavier has received that information. And Xavier has used that information the way he thought Zandra wanted that information to be used. And he's resurrected her. So this argument is over now. We are done. Your Empress has been brought back. Your Empress will be restored. And everything in the Shi'ar Empire will be maintained. That's kind of the irony of all this. Because at the end of the day, no matter what's being done here, no matter what Storm is saying here, insofar as it's saying like, I don't want to be seen as some kind of a dictatorial queen ruling this place with an iron fist. The reality is she's operating that way. That Storm is falling down this path of just becoming this absolute ruler. And so the question's going to be, or at least has to be asked, what happens when the time comes that someone challenges that, that someone stands to her or even the Araco people stand against her, what's that going to look like? But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. The next time you see our coverage of X-Men Red will be during the events of Judgment Day. So thank you all for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.